there was this entire seismic shift, each piece of which required several other things to change, which made the game massively better along multiple axes. And realizing that was sort of like, you know, one penny dropping, a second penny dropping, a third penny dropping, and then a giant earthquake. Um, <laughs> everything changed over the course of like three to four months, which then, as mentioned, reset all of my understanding of the game and everything had to be changed again. <laughs> um, you know. Yeah. Cardboard Creations, where we discuss the process, techniques, and inspiration for designing board games. I'm your host, Candace Harris, and I'm thrilled to be here today with Eric Royce to find out how Spirit Island was created. But first, let's jump into a brief overview of how Spirit Island works. Spirit Island is a complex and thematic cooperative game for one to four players where your goal is to defend your island home from colonizing invaders. Players take on the roles of different spirits of the land, each with its own unique elemental powers. Every turn, players simultaneously choose a growth action, gain energy, and decide which of their power cards to play. Fast powers take effect immediately before the invaders spread and ravage, but slow powers require forethought and planning to use effectively. Using combinations of power cards that match a spirit's elemental affinities can grant free bonus effects. After the spirits take their turn, the invaders explore, build, and ravage parts of the island while the spirits work with the Dahan natives to fight and scare off the invaders. The game escalates as it progresses. Spirits spread their presence to new parts of the island and seek out new and more potent powers while the invaders step up their colonization efforts. At the beginning of the game, winning requires destroying every last settlement and city on the board. But as you frighten the invaders more and more, victory becomes easier. However, the spirits can lose the game if any spirit is destroyed, if the island is overrun by blight, or if the invader deck is depleted before achieving victory. Hi Eric, how's it going? Going great, Candace. How are you? Oh, I am doing really well. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Uh, you know, like Spirit Island is such an awesome cooperative game. It's it's one of my favorites, and I love I love number one the theme. I love how challenging it is, and I really love how the card play works in conjunction with all of those different unique spirits. Yeah, it's just it's such a great game. I love the complexity of it. So I gotta know, like, what initially inspired you to create Spirit Island? So there were two pieces, uh, one thematic, one mechanical. The thematic came about essentially as a reaction to the prevalence of themes in Euro games about colonization and with a very sort of tone deaf attitude, you know, looking at it purely from the European point of view and not at all from the point of view of those being colonized. Uh, on the mechanical side, there were a number of excellent co-ops out there, but they mostly were on the lighter side. When I first started designing Spirit Island, uh, the Mage Knight co-op by uh, uh, Vlada hadn't come out yet. So like the heaviest co-op that I had ever played was Knizia's Lord of the Rings back from like around 2000. And I really wanted something which was a little bit longer, a little bit meatier. Um, there were longer co-ops, but they were like six hour, like huge sprawling all day affairs. And I kind of wanted something that hit the, the nice strategic sweet spot, but was more like, you know, a two, two and a half hour game. Cool. Uh, so mashing those two together sort of, and a couple of other ideas, like which kind of got stirred into the pot, uh, some of which didn't survive, ended up resulting in Spirit Island. Awesome, awesome. So how did you get from that initial idea and inspiration into a playable prototype? It was interesting. So I first took some work on it like in 2010 and sat down and thought like, okay, I like this idea, let me play around with it. Took a few months and figured out a few things, but then saw the scope of the project I'd be working on and was daunted and went, okay, and kind of put it down. Um, <laughs> and it kind of simmered in the back of my head for, I don't know, like a year, two years until I picked it back up again, partly because I wanted to set myself a challenge and partly because Ted Vesenes, uh, who is lead developer on Spirit Island and a friend of mine, 
uh, expressed a lot of enthusiasm about it when I told him about the concept. And those, those two things together kind of inspired me to be like, okay, all right, let's let's do the big lift here. And so that got me doing a lot of brainstorming on my own. And then from there, it was heading into sort of early prototype creation. Cool. And can you go into uh, a little bit like what your prototyping process is like? Like, how did you create the cards and, and the, the board? And also what, you know, from... Did you always have in your head like there are going to be these power cards and all of these different types of spirits like when how did things evolve and yeah and can you talk about your prototyping process a little bit sure so that very early 2010 prototyping process involved just scribbling things pen on paper it was just get the ideas out it was not a fully featured game it was a testing systems i learned virtually nothing about how the spirits would work at that point. What I hashed out then were the invader mechanics, the sort of explore, build, ravage cycle. I had this, initially this hand-drawn map with like lots of arrows between lands and that sort of, you know, just the different land types were just different colors and a deck of cards for like, okay, where are the invaders going to do different things? And in the process of experimenting there, just fiddling around, like modifying as I went, I realized like it's kind of thematically unsatisfying when the invaders like make a big push to this area of the island and then sit there doing nothing for a long time. Ah. <laughs> it was sort of just anticlimactic. And so I came up with this idea of instead of having like the invaders do three different types of things in three ran you know, arbitrary lands depending on the card, instead it goes through this sort of conveyor belt of actions where it gives the invaders intent. And I really liked that where it's like, oh, this is a, a great system for modeling that they have a goal and they're pursuing that goal. And it also adds strategy because you can interrupt that sequence of events. Right, right. So that was all pen and paper. I, and, and maybe like there was a printout at some point. Uh, the very early, it was like, I was still thinking spirit of a place, like genius loci, but I don't think I even, I don't think I even played it in any sense. Like I just ran invaders and to see like, how could I make an interesting spread? Before making the spirits, and this was the reason I initially put it down, was that I needed to do a huge amount of thematic work. All of my previous games had been very much towards sort of the, the Euro side of things, where theme was an aid to learning, but fundamentally everything was very symmetrical, maybe with like, you know, a few player powers or the like, but it didn't involve huge amounts of what I'll call content, like the power cards in Spirit Island. Each power card can change or break the rules but fundamentally each power card is a piece of content that works with the normal rules for power cards and i knew that there should be a lot of them. there should be a lot of variety there's a lot of variety in nature and i sat down and thought okay so just thinking for myself for all of the all of the reading i've done through my life all of the myths and fairy tales and creation stories and all those things what are different ways in which spirits of the land, and there's lots of different spirits of the land depending on where in the world you, you are, what are ways they could theoretically drive off colonizing invaders? And I just came up with like six pages or eight pages of raw ideas, and from there sort of grouped them. I'm like, okay, these are all kind of similar. Like these are all basically hurting them. These are all basically like, you know, moving them around and different types, you know, these are, you know, using the environment like wild beasts coming after them. So I tried grouping them and it was that kind of very heavy lifting of like, okay, I need to come up with a huge amount of thematic content. And then from there, I need to come up with all of these different power cards that was very intimidating and sort of the initial lift. Uh, I typed those up in just some word processing program for just fast iteration to get them out there. And I, uh, you know, sort of ran initial tests with myself where everything was horribly broken and eventually <laughs> got it to a place where I'm like, OK, like, I think I could show this to other people now. And I think then I was still just using a word processing app at the time. I didn't have any of the Adobe products. So those weren't options um, these days when I'm doing that sort of early prototyping. I'll use like InDesign because I already have the license. I have templates from a bunch of existing prototypes. So it's actually just as easy for me to like grab an existing game copy, delete all the cards, tweak the layout a little bit and use that. But at the time that wasn't true. Ah, um, cool. So also tabletop simulator did not factor into this at all because this was 2012 and TTS didn't come out until 2015, so. Oh, that's so cool to hear and fascinating. 
So what, like at that point, did you, you know, you figured out you were going to have these power cards. Mm -hmm. Did you have spirit abilities and know how the flow of the turns for the spirits would work? So sort of what I did early on, because I knew that anything which involved heavy asymmetry, which the spirits definitely wanted, was going to sort of have to be built on the bedrock of the base mechanisms. And those were still very much in upheaval. So what I did was I kind of simulated unique powers by spirit by saying, okay, grab three power cards off the top of the deck and those are your starting unique powers. Uh, so you kind of got grab bag. Um, ah, cool. And as for the flow of the turn, that started out, like my initial conceptions of the game in order to like stop the alpha player issue, which some groups run into, my initial thought was that it was going to be effectively action programming with sort of a timed order of things resolving, like you see in uh, some games like you know, Robo Rally, uh, where you, know, you put these things down and you flip them up, and that lack of communication would result in imperfect play, which results in more interesting situations sometimes, and prevent anybody from taking over each other's turns. That turned out to not actually work for a variety of reasons, but it did lead eventually to the fast-slow split where the spirits can do some things before the invaders and other things after the invaders, with the slower things being giving you more bang for the buck in terms of spending energy to get a particular effect. If you're willing to do it more slowly, then it tends to, to be cheaper or be more powerful. And by the time I started playtesting with other people, I was down to like, three different speeds, like super fast, fast, and slow. And like inside of the first play test, I'm like, nope, this doesn't fly. Everything, smush the two fasts together. We just have before invaders and after invaders. Uh, but that was sufficiently rewarding that that stayed through the end product. Cool, yeah, and I was just about to ask you, perfect segue there, Eric. Um, you mentioned, you know, you were kind of play testing on your own as like many designers do initially. Um, but can you go into a little more detail on like what your playtesting process was like, especially initially, like I know you have a lot of, there are a lot of expansions for Spirit Island now, but like initially. It's totally like, different now. Yeah. <laughs> totally different now. <laughs> initially, what was your playtesting process like and how much playtesting did you do on the initial base game release? So the initial testing was like basically all of my prototypes, just me trying it to see if it functions. Uh, a metaphor I sometimes use is that uh, the systems of a game are kind of like wheels. And before you put the game in front of other people, the wheels need to turn. Like, you can, they can't be triangles. Uh, they need to actually be able to bump along, like, you know, at least maybe <laughs> pentagons. Uh, <laughs> really lumpy. They're going to be awkward. They're going to need rounding and smoothing. Uh, but they need to go. And so I test it myself until I feel confident, okay, this will go. Like, it can... It can do a thing right. uh, instead of grinding to a halt in, in, in the first 10 minutes. Once it got to that point, I took it to a local convention because once I'm done, I'll tend to then play test with other people because there's a huge amount of information which you get when you're play testing with people just watching them. You know, the feedback from them can also be super valuable, but just observing people's hesitations, people's reactions. Uh, it's something these days that I find a little challenging about using tabletop simulator for playtesting is that uh, I don't see the people and that cuts out a huge amount of information. Right. Uh, so I like in-person playtesting when I can. And I was do I hadn't brought it over to a game day yet. This was kind of the first opportunity. So I brought it to the convention and showed it off and it was in this super rough state. And on like, well, Spirit Island is only my second published design. It is by far for my second design. Like, I've been designing games for a very long time. So I'm very familiar with how playtesting play usually goes. And it got an unusually good reception. Like, people were asking, can I get a copy, can I, like, print a copy of this out on my own? And I'm like, okay, that's a really good sign, given how much material there is and how involved it is, and frankly, how rough it was. Like, it was really, really rough. And that's cool. That's cool. So I started playtesting it with other people, but it also spread to sort of third party testing sooner than I'd anticipated and sooner than I would usually do just organically because there was the opportunity. People were eager to do it. And so I said, OK, 
Sure. And I put together sort of a print and play kit. Uh, I also knew that I was under the gun and time was important because this was like March of 2012. And my wife and I were expecting our first child in June of 2012. Oh, so, <laughs> game changer. Fasting or everything. And so I'm like, okay, if we can move faster, great. Let's do that. <laughs> wow. Uh, cool. Yeah. Cool. From there, it got kind of lumpy. Like there was a whole, I did intense play testing for like the next three months, lots of iteration. Uh, then we had our kid, things basically just stopped. And then after halt. <laughs> three months or so, I started like dipping my toes back in and moving back. I signed the game, you know, things accelerated more Then the greater than games play testers came on and there was this huge three month long, like intense play testing fest. And then we had our second kid and bam, stop. <laughs> So, like, playtesting was this, you know, the volume kept growing, but in terms of the number of testers, but the activity level was very spiky. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> uh, so, at what point did you start writing the rules and actually, like, documenting rules for Spirit Island? Sooner than I normally would have because of those people asking for a kick. So, I needed to give them the rules. It's like, oh, right, no. right. Uh, usually when I'm prototyping, I will... Instead of writing a rule book, I will make the play aids more comprehensive than they may otherwise be, because that serves as sort of a touchstone if I end up unexpectedly called away and need to come back to the game. Like I have games where I have failed to write down any rules and then I come back two years later and I'm like, these components look really interesting. Uh, it's a shame I don't remember how you play at all. Uh, so I try I try and avoid that. Usually yeah. I'll, I'll, I will also play aids tend to be much more brief and unlike a rule book they're not trying to teach the game rule books have a really hard job like a rule book is a double lift of teaching and reference but a player aid is only reference and so it's easier to spit one out and be like okay here's all the relevant the super relevant information and it can be you know if, if there's stuff which isn't really important to present to the player but i want to remember i'll put it in the file just off to the side where it doesn't print and so that way, like, I have a reference for what are the rules of this game if I need to, say, take half a year off to go parent my infant child. Uh, <laughs> things like that. That makes sense. Uh, now was a good call. <laughs> uh, so what, what would you say was your, like, biggest challenge besides uh, parenting <laughs> um, as you were designing and developing Spirit Island? I've talked about two of them. One was sort of the initial lift, the content, the heavy theming resulting in just the need to generate lots of powers, lots of spirits, adversaries, do research on what colonialism was like, do research on sort of what our island cultures like to try and both represent the Dahan, the indigenous peoples of Spirit Island, as reasonably realistic mm -hmm. yeah. setting aside the whole like you know the premise of the game um but also not be any specific culture and not be appropriative so there's all of this upfront work to do um there's also the kids and then the last is i guess i also touched on that which is sort of the layer cake nature where there's these core systems and then there's other things built on that and then there's the variable player stuff built on that where there's all these different things which layer on top of each other and if one of the like if one of the core systems of the game changes that affects every single spirit and power card in the game so trying to fine tune balance those things before the core systems are nailed down doesn't work but if you don't have any spirits or power cards you can't stress test the core system so it's this constant sort of you know iterating up and down where you think your bedrock is firm and then you go up and you try out a bunch of stuff and you discover no it needs to change it changes and then everything needs to be tweaked to some extent and you work again and then this is settled so then you go up to the next higher level uh, and you bounce up and down until everything finally settles out that was the other big challenge just the highly iterative nature of any board game design really but especially something more complex and yeah. yeah for that actually having kids helped uh because it meant it kind of forced me to take a slower timetable and let things kind of bake and percolate in the back of my head i feel like spirit island is a better game because of that enforced longer development time. Ah, very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, and when when you uh, were originally playtesting, did you have all of the different spirits in mind, and you know, you just 
or did you say, nope, these are, you know, the starting ones. And if we have expansions later down the line, we'll figure out what we want to do with them. Oh, geez. I went through, there, there are loads of spirits from initial playtesting, which never made it into the base game or indeed in final form. Some of them you'll see, you know, concepts like there was one spirit sort of, sort of midway through, not in the early stages, but I think before it went to crowdfunding, uh, called Memory of the First Embers. And it did not survive, but some parts of its concept eventually became Shifting Memory of Ages and Jagged Earth. Like, there's a lot of those. There's others which just didn't make it entirely, but I included, like, small call-outs to them in one of the scenarios in Branch and Claw, Powers Long Forgotten. Uh, the the things which are found, the, th the things of power which are found, many of those are references to spirits from the initial playtesting, which didn't, which never made it in for one reason or another. Um, so I, I was constantly working and reworking, and you know what's going to be included, what's a even like what's a good starter spirit? Ah, that was figuring that out as I went along. Like ah. uh, at some point, I think you know partway through, I sat down. I'm like, okay, all right, you know I have all these concepts. Some of these should be good intro spirits. Which are they going to be? And that's when like lightning swift strike and river surges in sunlight kind of really started be were first identifiably like them and you could point at them sort of thing. Gotcha. Gotcha. Cool. 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 Um, did you have any aha moments as you were designing and developing spirit Island? A bunch of them, uh, <laughs> more than I can easily go through. I'll talk about three real quick. Uh, okay, sure. one was I mentioned that I did a bunch of brainstorming about like, how would you get rid of invaders? Uh, something which I didn't hit on early on was frightening them away. Like that was in my brainstormed list, but I always thought of frightening away as removing them or causing them to physically move around on the island. The whole fear subsystem and how it ties into victory was not part of the initial game until after one play tested Origins. And I was talking it over with two of the folks who tested it. And it was like, oh, this is what needs to happen. Uh, Eureka! So, bing! Eureka. Uh, cool. A second one was it used to be that sacred sites, which are two or more presents in a given land, area concentrations of power, used to be a completely separate piece from presence. If you didn't have any presence, they were destroyed, but they, they, uh, and your presence adding boosted your energy, your sacred sites adding boosted how many card plays you got. So there's this trade off, this tension, mm -hmm. uh, but you only had one presence track. And a comment which one tester made was like, like, you know, it seems like these pieces aren't necessarily like pulling their weight. You know, at the time, like, oh, no, they're way too deeply entwined with the game. Like, they've got to stay. And like a year, year and a half later, uh, other factors, uh, including another aha, which was playing another game at PAX East and being like, this game has totally unique cards for every different player position. I should, too. Uh, because up until then, each spirit had three cards, which were the same across all spirits. And that they were the infrastructure cards, add presence, add sacred sites, uh, uh, interact with the Dahan. And it turns out that if you drop those and give each spirit four unique cards instead of three, it's awesome. And if you drop sacred sites and make it like there was this entire seismic shift, each piece of which required several other things to change, which made the game massively better along multiple axes. And realizing that was sort of like, you know, one penny dropping, a second penny dropping, a third penny dropping, and then a giant earthquake. Um, <laughs> everything changed over the course of like three to four months, which then, as mentioned, reset all of my understanding of the game and everything had to be changed again. Um, you know. Yeah. Very so. cool. Um, that's awesome. So I love uh, the look and feel of Spirit Island, and I love all of the different spirit, the art on the spirit boards, the cards. How were the art and graphic design decisions made? They were all done by Greater Than Games, although uh, Adam Rebataro, who was doing all of the art direction for Greater Than Games at the time, before he commissioned any of the spirit art, he kind of talked with me. We put our heads together to like, and, you know, we found a bunch of things online and he's like, okay, you know, which of these looks do you like to try and narrow down the look and feel of the game? Uh, and also I was involved in the process for selecting artists. Um, cool. After that, it was entirely like, it was, it was Adam's show. He was taking things and figuring everything out. So uh, at the time I was uninvolved. Cool. And it, is there a different person that was doing the graphic design versus the art or 
Yeah, we hired out artists. The graphic design was done in-house uh, by, I believe it was Jen who was doing the graphic design for the initial game. And the there was also iconography, which may have been done by somebody else, but I've totally lost track. Like, look in the rule book. Like, the rule, the rule book will give you the names for all the folks <laughs> uh, who, who contributed uh, uh, because I didn't always manage to keep track of who exactly at Greater Than Games was doing what thing. Uh, so... Yeah, no, like some of the iconography was loosely based off of what I used for prototyping, but mostly not. Uh, okay. Mostly that was all them, like, you know, tidying it up and making it look awesome. <laughs> nice, nice. The prototype, all of my prototype spirits uh, have, a, like, a carved out space in the panel with a little tiny parenthetical which says, imagine there is awesome art here. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. When and how did you come up with the name Spirit Island? The very first iteration was genius loci for like, you know, spirit of place. Then I'm like, wait, that's kind of like a Greek term. Maybe I should not use that. Uh, all right, spirit island, it's descriptive. It's like, it's a good prototype title. It worked pretty well. As we headed towards publication, Greater Than Games and I sort of put our heads together, brainstormed a whole bunch of possible alternatives. But spirit island, there's always the danger with the prototype title that you'll end up getting so used to it that anything else feels wrong. So there's probably some of that, but there was also the fact that it kind of was simple, straightforward. It did what it said on the tin. Like it was fairly unique, but there was sort of like at the time there were several different Island cooperative games. So it's like, okay, it kind of fits into that. Uh, like in terms of like, there seems to be some sort of weird zeitgeist about cooperative games being set on islands. Well, it's not really intentional, but at least it doesn't run counter to it. Right. Uh, uh, and also, but at that point, they and I had been running playtests of it at conventions for like three years. And it's like, okay, and Spirit Island also just has name recognition at this point. Like I collected a list of like 150 email addresses of people who wanted to know if it went to crowdfunding. Uh, they had been getting signups. So it's like, oh, yeah, if we use the original title, we also have the benefit of all those people who saw it in the convention halls just walking by. We'll be like, oh, yeah, it's that thing I saw. Right. So, you know, so it had a lot of advantages and nothing else we came up with really worked nearly as well. So we're like, yeah, sure. Great. We'll go with it. Yeah, it, it, it works great. So when did you know the game was finished and ready to kind of go to it was it, it was originally a kickstarter right yeah a, a, yeah. a crowdfunded on kickstarter for yeah. everything so when through. when when did you and greater than games know okay we're ready to like launch this campaign so there was a deadline in the form of the birth of our second child uh, <laughs> so i mentioned a very intense fall which was the fall before that happened. So we did a bunch of playtesting then. I mean, when I handed off the game to Greater Than Games playtesting group, it totally worked. Like the game was playable. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't nearly as balanced and you know, it, it wanted more development basically. Uh, but all of the sort of substructure stuff was mostly pretty much settled. Uh, by that point, it was about playtesting the content and occasionally about rules. But, you know, that had been more going, me and Christopher going back and forth or me and Ted talking about things or just me running off and testing with the folks during the years. Uh, so we did this big push and then I had my second kid and I was offline for a while. And I didn't know at the time, like, as far as I knew, it could be that like at that point they were going to run the Kickstarter that February, like after our kid was born in January. But it turned out that the art took a really long time and so, or there was something else, I can't even remember what. And so the crowdfunding didn't end up happening until the next October. Gotcha. And by that point, I was enough in the groove with parenting that I could spend some time on it again. And so there was a second push just before and during and after the crowdfunding campaign. So by October, I was able to get some more time on it again. And I, uh, did some additional work, you know, additional polish again, like you can spend nearly infinite time on development for any game. And when you have a game with lots of content and lots of asymmetry, that's like doubly true. <laughs> but no matter how much time we had at some point, you're kind of changing things just to change things. You know, it takes more and more knowledge of the game in order to improve it. And no matter how much playtesting you do, a game will see 
like people beating on the game once it's released will find things which your testers probably didn't just because there's going to be orders of magnitude more people uh, who are going after it for longer. And that's been especially true with Spirit Island because it was very popular. So we did as much fine tuning as we could. Uh, we felt like, yes, the game is in a great place. Uh, but at some point you actually have to ship the product because you know, a perfect game that never ships is way worse than a like mostly great game, which has some flaws, which actually makes it to people and gets played. Right, so, right. Yeah, in terms of the actual timetables, like my timetables were all being set by my kids. Greater than games timetables, I don't know exactly what their things were, but they like they know the games industry. They know that. That's why I work with publishers, is because like that way they can make those decisions and handle that end. And, and right. I don't need to make these calls. <laughs> I can put it, I can give my give my thoughts, and then they can be like, "Oh no, actually, you know, this is better to do in May." I'm like, "Okay, great, fantastic. You are the people who know things." <laughs> awesome, awesome. Um, so, Eric, do you have any advice for someone out there who would be interested in designing a cooperative board game? Cooperative specifically, yeah. I've, on my website, I have a few pieces of sort of like general game inv design advice, which folks have asked. I've decided, okay, let's start posting them so that others can read. For co-ops, I would say make sure to decouple victory and defeat. Uh, most good co-ops allow you to be very close to winning and losing at the same time. Uh, and if those are too, if they're too tightly bound, like in Spirit Island, if losing was too many invaders on the board and winning was get them all off the board, then if you're close to one, you can't be close to the other. Uh, so second thing is think about the feelings evoked by sort of the fundamental progressions over time that your game has. Uh, in Spirit Island, that's gaining more power cards, uncovering more present stuff, becoming more powerful for the spirits, but also the invaders progressing through the invader deck, progressing through the fear deck. Uh, in a game like Gloomhaven, it's slowly like, you know, fewer and fewer cards to work with, feeling like you're running out of endurance. Uh, but there are also being fewer and fewer enemies, like, you know, you're reaching uh, an end state. Uh, and in you know, Forbidden Island, there's things sinking all over the place. So consider the, the arc of your game, effectively. What the mechanics dictate will change over time. And there should be something which changes over time, or else it's going to feel like you're doing the same thing over and over with no context change. And that can be fine for like, you know, five or 10 or 15 minutes. But if you're looking at a 45 plus minute game, like lather, rinse, repeat, nothing has changed that gets less interesting. So think about those feelings. And I'll put in a selfish pitch for uh, design co-ops that I that I enjoy. Uh, yeah. In that there's a particular there's a particular <laughs> dynamic which is really easy to do in co-ops uh, to scale player count by saying, okay, one player takes a turn, then the game takes a turn, then the player then another player takes a turn, then a game takes a turn. And some games like you, some designs just that's kind of the best way. But if you can avoid it, I find that that pattern tends to as you increase player count, divide the same quantity of game and decision-making and narrative and happenings among more and more people. And so, like, if you're playing a game like that, which is two-player, it may feel like you're getting to do a lot of stuff. And if you're playing it five-player, it may feel like you're mostly spectating. So I really like games which find other solutions for that, where there's, you know, more things, more challenges to deal with. Uh, Spirit Island, I did that by adding more island boards gloomhaven does it by adding more opponents like so that everybody gets to do just as much stuff against a harder foe that is not a design absolute that's not saying you have to do this that's yeah, saying right. i personally like those <laughs> very cool that's that that's all like very sound advice for that i wouldn't even think about but yeah um in terms of like designing a cooperative game uh, very cool so Eric, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure talking to you today and like hearing the backstory for how you and you know the team at Greater Than Games and your developer designed Spirit Island. I know you have like there are, again, there are a lot of expansions for Spirit Island, Nature Incarnates on the way. Then you have the the streamlined version, Horizons of Spirit Island. But is there anything else coming down the pike for Spirit Island or anything else that you're working on that uh, you'd like to share? So you mentioned Nature Incarnate, which is at the printer. They, I am doing and have been doing for a while groundwork for a Dahan-centric expansion that is not guaranteed. Like nothing is guaranteed until it goes to the printer and gets to store shelves. Cool. But it is my hope and intent 
to uh, be able to to design and make something which is much more focused around the Dahan. Ideally, like playing as them, that would be super awesome. Uh, but I need to actually like see if it works. I've been doing largely uh, background work on that, uh, although just starting to dip a toe into mechanics. Uh, For Science is another cooperative game of mine. It's a real-time dexterity block builder. It has, at this point, pretty much sold out, but it is likely, fingers crossed, to get a reprint at some point through crowdfunding. I don't have any timing or details on that. Um, Hopefully, it might also include some sort of new tidbits or promos for people who already have the game. Again, don't know. The future is still nebulous, but fingers crossed. Uh, And finally, something I'm involved with, which is also a shout out, uh, I, uh, Bez, uh, who uh, I think you know, is yes. her 1,000th live stream is going to be on the 18th of May. 1,000. And <laughs> she's going to have a whole bunch of guests on it, including at least two Eric's. Uh, <laughs> I will be on around like 3.40 p.m. UK time, 10.40 a.m. Eastern U.S. time. And I think I saw she said on Twitter that Eric Lang is going to be on at like 2 p.m. UK, 8 a.m. Eastern. She is Stuff by Bez, all one word, on Twitch, Twitter, basically everywhere. But, you know, I'm going to be there if you want to jump online and uh, listen to me talk about stuff with some other designers. And I don't know exactly what the format's going to be. So, you know, or, or even if you can't, you know, if you want to go see Eric Lang or somebody else, like, should be awesome. Should be a great time. Tune in for some part of it. Should be fantastic. Yeah, Bez is awesome. I met yes. her at uh, at Essen last year, so that was cool. Eric, thank you again. Like thank my you. mind is still like spiraling with everything you just said for the past half hour or so. But yeah, thank you so much for being here. Um, again, I'm a fan of Spirit Island. I think it's great, and I'm excited to see whatever you do next with it. And I'll have to try for science because I yeah. didn't know about that, and I, I I I just always forget about it. But I need to try that game too. Um, so anyway, thank you again for being here. All right. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great. Thank you all for watching Cardboard Creations. Hopefully it's been as inspiring and fascinating for you as it has been for me. And remember, the only way to get something done is to start doing it. (laughs) 